We might get started, I think. So thank you for joining our webinar today. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. My name's Nell Thompson and I'm the Secretary of the Australian Institute of Animal Management and I'll be hosting the webinar for you today. I've been on the AIM committee since 2013 and I'm also the coordinator of the National Getting to Zero program. The Australian Institute of Animal Management, or as we call it AIM, is the national peak body representing local government animal management officers. The AIM committee consists of a wide range of professionals engaged in the various aspects of animal management. AIM seeks to support those engaged in the business of animal management and the function itself by providing training and information, opportunities for networking and collaboration, and by encouraging the use of best practice policy and practices. AIM understands the significant pressures placed on local government and not-for-profit rescue and rehoming service providers when working in the companion animal management space. We welcome new members and people can join via our website at www.aim.org.au. So to today's presentation. Once I hand over to our presenter, there'll be around 45 minutes of presentation and around 15 minutes of question time once the presentation has concluded. The recording of this webinar will be accessible via our website to all our members to watch at any time. We're going to ask that everyone mutes themselves during the presentation, unless our presenter indicates otherwise. And if you have questions, you can start putting them in the Q&A section and we'll get through as many as we can at the end of the session. If you have very quick questions that relate to your understanding of the content, put your hand up and we'll try and get to them during the presentation. If you have more questions, or we don't get to yours during the question time, you can send a message to our Facebook page and we'll get to it that way. As always, please excuse any working from home background noises that may filter through. We are very grateful to have Bonnie coming here with us today from AMRIC to talk about the new canine disease, ehrlichiosis. Bonnie is a veterinarian and program manager strategic delivery for animal management in rural and remote Indigenous communities, a national not-for-profit organisation that coordinates veterinary and education programs in rural and remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Bonnie's role with AMRIC is diverse and includes establishing and managing strategic partnerships and projects, monitoring and evaluation, managing the development of the AMRIC app and policy and protocol development. For the last 13 months, ehrlichiosis has been a huge part of Bonnie's role. On behalf of AMRIC and the remote Indigenous communities that they service, Bonnie has been raising awareness of the impacts of ehrlichiosis to all levels of government, as well as relevant community-based stakeholders. Bonnie has been leading the AMRIC team to develop a range of education resources about this new disease and is actively involved with ongoing government responses to this disease. So over to you, Bonnie. Now, just before we do, I see a message down here. Is the, is the sound working okay as it's hard to hear the speaker? Oh, I'm sorry, Craig. Is your sound still not working very well? How's everyone else's sound? My sounds for you is good now. Okay, yes, and I can hear you too, Bonnie. So, um, Brooke, thank you, sounds good. Craig, I'm wondering whether if you um, log out and maybe log back in again or something like that, um, sometimes things can be a bit glitchy. Sorry about that. Anyway, let's get going. Over to you, Bonnie. Thank you, Nell. Um, big thanks for inviting me to speak about disease. Um, it's certainly, as you said, it's been a big part of my role um, and a big part of the work that AMRIC has been doing. Before I get into it, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country where I'm based, which are the Walker people uh, here in, in southeast Queensland, also the Larrakia people where the AMRIC office is based, um, and also the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander custodians of the land where you're joining us from today. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and thank them for their important and continuing commitment to care for country. 
Um, so as a bit of an overview, I'll first give you a brief background introduction to AMRIC for those of you who aren't familiar. I'll then move on to what ehrlichiosis is, how um, it's presenting in, in dogs and how it's diagnosed the clinical features. We'll talk a bit about the Australian outbreak that, that's been occurring since May of last year. And then of course, the implications and considerations for local governments specifically. So AMRIC works in partnership with rural and remote Indigenous communities across Australia. And in rural and remote locations, just as for anywhere else, companion animal populations, of course, require regular access to veterinary services and animal health products to maintain adequate health and welfare. Given the geographic, socioeconomic, cultural and historic factors uh, of many remote Indigenous communities, the accessibility for many of these communities to veterinary services can be really challenging, though. And the fact is that in remote areas, which are indicated by the dark blue of this map, vet services are really hard to come by. Often the nearest vet clinic is hundreds, if not thousands of kilometres away. Uh, and if we take the Northern Territory, for example, there are only five regions within the Northern Territory where there are permanent veterinary clinics, and they're indicated by the red dots here. So there's a whole lot of country surrounding these regions where vets just aren't permanently available. So it's little wonder then with such limited access to animal health services combined with seasonally favourable climatic conditions that companion animals in rural and remote locations can end up with extreme parasite burdens like these tick burdens pictured here. Ticks are of course a problem in of themselves but combined with the threat of tick-borne diseases such as Babesia, Anaplasma and now Ehrlichia, they represent a major concern for dog populations as well as their owners. Now, due to their free roaming nature, there's a common misconception that companion animals in remote Indigenous communities are unowned and unlo unloved strays, but this is far from the case. Despite the challenges of access to veterinary services, companion animals are integral to the fabric of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community culture, and just as in more accessible locations, are valued for a wide variety of reasons. You know, they're trusted confidants and grounding companions. Some are culturally significant. Many are important hunting aids or protectors, and they can also serve as a source of warmth for those cold winter months in desert communities. Recognizing the intrinsic value of companion animals is something that AMRIC has always had at its core. For those that aren't, at, that aren't familiar with us, AMRIC or Animal Management in Rural and Remote Indigenous Communities is a national not-for-profit organisation that applies a One Health, One Wellbeing approach to ensure that remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities receive culturally safe veterinary and animal-focused education programs. Our vision is for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities that are healthy and safe for people and their companion animals. AMRIC became formally incorporated in 2003 and were founded by a handful of dedicated veterinary and environmental health professionals who had a vision for a coordinated and holistic approach to companion animal management in remote Indigenous communities. We exist to assist and empower communities to meet their needs for companion animal health, care and safety. AMRIC's board and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Advisory Committee work together to guide and govern AMRIC. And we have a small team of 11 staff members who work closely with our many and varied collaborating partners nationally. Keys to our approach are understanding and respecting people's connections to their animals. Uh, and many of those, those connections, of course, are very culturally significant as well. Working with all stakeholders to co-design and implement culturally appropriate and tailored programs that meet the needs of each community as a whole, and really valuing relationships. So building trust, advocating best practice and doing so with experience and authenticity. Our three core areas of work are veterinary services, animal and one health and one wellbeing focused education and training and advocacy and research. Of course, as we've already noted, remote community companion animals, just like any other population, requires access to veterinary services. But without this access, animal health and welfare can deteriorate. And in turn, animal population management issues that impact on community health and well-being increase. 
AMRIC works to mitigate the geographic and socioeconomic challenges that, that exist in many remote communities, assisting those communities to access vital veterinary services. To do so, we work in partnership with regional councils, shires, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations, universities, state and federal governments, other not-for-profits, and of course, veterinary service providers themselves. We're also able to enhance the outcomes of veterinary programs through our incredibly dedicated volunteer veterinarians who volunteer their skills and time to work alongside each community's regular veterinary service provider. AMRIC's veterinary partners deliver services focusing on humane companion animal population management uh, through surgical dissection predominantly, antiparasitic treatments to mitigate zoonotic disease risks in particular, and of course, treatment of animal injury and illness as they occur. Local engagement, knowledge and skills are critical to the sustainability and effectiveness of remote community companion animal health and management programs. And so AMRIC has over the years developed a wide variety of animal related educational resources, activities and programs covering a range of topics, including health and hygiene around animals, responsible pet ownership, empathy for animals and dog behaviour and safety. AMRIC's education and training programs cater to people of varying ages from children right through to adults and are tailored to suit the context and culture of local communities. We ideally aim to always train the trainer so that we're embedding that knowledge within each community. A large part of my work in particular is advocacy and research and really AMRIC operates as a knowledge broker working with, sharing knowledge and catalyzing relationships between a complex array of stakeholders, including indigenous corporations, remote local government authorities, veterinary service providers, environmental health and medical organizations, schools and other community service organizations, universities and research institutes, and state and federal government departments. Through this work, we're trying to build the evidence base for One Health links between animal and human uh, health, um, and also recognise that the, the health and well-being of animals is intricately connected to that of community. Of course, the benefits of effective companion animal management are many. And so AMRIC's One Health well-being, One Wellbeing focused programs aim to improve companion animal health and welfare, improve human health and well-being by reducing the risk of zoonotic diseases. That, that's those diseases that can be transmitted between animals and people by reducing the stress and worry that comes from animals that are sick, injured or in poor condition also. Animal management programs that are delivered effectively can also enhance empathy development by improving the human animal bond. They improve community amenity and safety by reducing the nuisance and threats associated with large uncontrolled dog and cat populations. They reduce the number of unwanted animals by achieving stable dog and cat populations through culturally appropriate, respectful and, hu and humane population management strategies. And they reduce negative impacts on wildlife and ecosystems and also reduce biosecurity threats. Of course, the big biosecurity story recently from an animal health perspective anyway, uh, has been the detections of ehrlichiosis in Australia. So ehrlichiosis, it's a bit of a mouthful. It's pronounced ehrlichiosis. It's caused by the bacteria Ehrlichia canis. And it's a, this bacteria that lives in the blood of infected dogs. And here in this image, you can see um, some of those dark purple bacteria sitting within a blood cell from an infected dog. How is it transmitted? Well, uh, tick-borne diseases are it is a tick-borne disease rather, and it's spread by the brown dog tick. Um, there's a bit of debate going on in the scientific community about the, the, the scientific name of this particular tick currently. Um, it used to be known as Rhyphocephalus sanguinis, um, but more recently it's just been classified as Rhyphocephalus linear. Um, nevertheless, it's commonly known as the brown dog tick, and that's the, the uh, only tick that's known to be able to transmit this bacteria, Ehrlichia canis. It's really important to understand that this disease cannot be transmitted directly from dog to dog. It can only be transmitted through the bite of a tick carrying that bacteria. Um, as part of our response to the leukiosis outbreak, AMRIC developed a series of educational resources about this disease. And this is just a, a segment of one of the, those educational resources and animation which talks about tick-borne diseases. 
And it just provides a great visual summary of how this disease is transmitted. So I just thought I'd play that for you all. So, Alikia canis, where is it worldwide? Um, prior to, 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 to 2020 or last year, uh, Alikia canis was known to occur in a large number of countries around the world, but it was considered exotic or not present in Australia. And it, so it was for that reason that it was on Australia's notifiable disease list. And so any dogs that were uh, going to be imported into Australia required testing and demonstration of negative results prior to importation. At this point, that requirement for a negative result for, Elikiana, uh, for elikiosis prior to importation is still in place. However, that may change as the elikiocana situation becomes even more established within Australia. Um, so obviously since the detections in 2020, it has been now present in Australia too. So, that map really should unfortunately be updated to show Australia in red also. So what happens to an infected dog? Well, first they're bitten by a tick that's carrying a Lichia canis. Uh, they will then enter a, a, an acute phase. So there are a number of different phases that are commonly known with this disease. Um, in reality, it's probably more of a spectrum than discrete phases. Um, but that nonetheless, what we normally see is that between two and four weeks after a tick that's carrying that bacteria bites a dog, the dog starts to become lethargic or tired. They are inappetent, they don't want to eat, they're anorexic. Um, and they also can start to develop some bleeding disorders. So this bacteria is really good at destroying platelets. And so they're the white blood cells that are responsible for the clotting mechanisms in all mammals' bodies. Um, and so this disease can really impact our ability to maintain a healthy blood system. Um, and, and by destroying those platelets, it does that. Now, in this acute phase, the disease may be responsible to treatment. Uh, sometimes treatment does result in a cure. The treatment that's recommended is a 28 day long antibiotic course with a particular antibiotic called doxycycline. Um, however, the response to that treatment is sometimes variable. So uh, whilst dogs, while some dogs may recover following treatment, others unfortunately don't and they progress to a subclinical phase. Now, dogs that haven't been treated at all will, will usually progress from the acute phase to the subclinical phase. When they're in this subclinical phase, the bacteria is actually dormant in their system. So it's like it's taking a little hibernation. It normally goes and hides in, in uh, either the bone marrow or the spleen, and it can actually be really hard to detect on blood tests during this time as well. Unfortunately, what we then see with this disease is that a number of cases can transition to this chronic phase. And this chronic phase is normally terminal or fatal uh, because it basically results in the, the dog's bone marrow being destroyed. And the bone marrow, of course, is basically where our immune system um, it, it originates. It's, it's responsible for, for making all of those immune system white blood cells. And so what happens to dogs when they're in this chronic stage is that they, their bone marrow is destroyed. They really don't have an immune system. They're very susceptible to other infections. And often what happens is that they'll pick up sepsis or a bacterial infection in their blood. Um, they've also still got those bleeding disorders associated with the lack of platelets. 
And so usually this disease is unfortunately fatal once it, once it reaches that chronic phase. The signs themselves, um, typically what's noticed about two to four weeks after that initial tick bite is that the dogs are feverish. Uh, so they have a high temperature, they're lethargic or they're tired, they're inaptent, they don't want to eat. Um, they often lose weight. And you can see this dog in this picture here is quite skinny and has, has lost considerable um, condition. Often they'll also develop conjunctivitis. So they'll get a, a mucky or a pussy eye. Um, a, a bit later in the disease, once the immune system starts responding to the bacteria, often um, sort of a month in, we start to see the development of cloudy eyes. And that's actually a result of the cornea. So the, the front clear section of the eye um, getting some fluid built up in it because of the immune response to this disease. Sometimes it can also result in the dogs having um, visual problems and, 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 and sometimes even the dogs can go blind as a result of this disease. We also, as we've touched on, see bleeding disorders and it's, and it's quite commonly reported that dogs will develop a persistent nosebleed that just doesn't stop. Um, we can also see things like edema, so fluid accumulation in the limbs and, and sort of under the jaw and in other areas of the body. Less commonly, but um, still acknowledged clinical signs can include things like muscle pain and stiffness, um, arthritis in the joints, enlarged spleens, enlarged lymph nodes, and sometimes some neurological signs as well. So um, sometimes that can present as things like seizures or um, vestibular syndrome where they're, they're a bit wobbly and, and unsure of their feet. Suffice it to say that this disease is a really serious disease. Um, and unfortunately, the presentation can often mimic other common diseases as well. So sometimes it can be actually a bit tricky to even pick up. How is it diagnosed? Um, so this disease, as I've already said, is notifiable, which means that anyone who suspects, who suspects the disease must report that disease to animal health authorities or, or at least a veterinarian. And veterinarians are legally obligated to immediately report any suspicious cases, either to the emergency animal disease hotline and the numbers on the slide there, or their state or territory government veterinary offices. Um, when that disease is reported, they'll be requested to take a blood sample from the suspected dog. Those samples have to be sent to the state or territory laboratory where they'll underdo, undertake some testing. And usually that testing is a PCR uh, and an IFA or an immunofluorescent antibody test looking at the serology. They normally do both tests in combination to try and pinpoint exactly where through this phase of the disease the dog is. Um, and then those results get reported back to the veterinarian and, and, and then subsequently on to the owners. As I said, this is notifiable. So please do make sure that if you are suspecting cases of this disease within your regions, that you do make your local veterinarians aware of that um, and that they are taking the appropriate measures to report this disease to the state and territory authorities. So the Australian outbreak. Um, the first cases were detected back in April and May of 2020. And there was a vet, uh, Dr. Sarah Brett, who's based in Kananara. She started noticing that a number of cases of, of dogs were presenting to her clinic with unusually severe clinical signs. Um, and these signs included things like severe bleeding disorders, nosebleeds, bleeding under the, uh, under the skin of the gums or under the, under the skin of the body. Um, they had fevers, they often had enlarged spleens, they had edema or fluid accumulation. Often they were developing cloudy eyes and blindness. And there was also a large number of unexplained deaths associated with these cases. So Dr. Sarah uh, took some blood uh, from those, those unusual cases that she was seeing. She notified the Western Australian Animal Health Authorities. They took those samples, did a whole lot of testing uh, and discovered that the, the likely cause was Ehrlichia canis, which as we've touched on earlier, was a disease that was previously thought to not occur in Australia. So subsequent to that in original detection back in April and May of 2020, all the, the, the states and territories within Australia were on high alert and started, surve uh, started their surveillance for this disease. Uh, the Northern Territory throughout June to around September found cases of this disease almost all throughout the Northern Territory. It, it's not in all communities and it certainly wasn't at that time, but it's, it's got a very wide geographic distribution. Um, 
And in February 2021, it was it was detected in the northern area of South Australia as well, so in the APY lands there. Now, at this point in time, there's been around or just over 500 cases that have been confirmed through laboratory samples. But it's important to understand that that's a real underrepresentation of what's actually happening on the ground. And that's because that most of the regions where this disease occurring are extremely remote and there's very limited veterinary capacity in most of those areas. Um, and this disease, as I said, you know, the only way to, to officially diagnose it is to take a blood sample and send that off to the state lab. And so if vets aren't uh, servicing these areas, then what that means is that there's not samples being collected, there's not uh, lab testing going on. And so really the, the number of cases that are, that are E. canis positive are likely to be well into the thousands. Um, this, is, this is a disease that's really well and truly established now within Australia. Um, you can see here these dotted arrows um, that, that are emerging from the Northern Territory and other regions into uh, Eastern States as well as Perth. Now, these are cases where dogs have inad inadvertently been imported from either the Northern Territory or Northern Western Australia into other regions. Um, and they've subsequently shown signs consistent with Elichia canis and have been tested positive then for that disease. So these are disease, these are dogs that have either been traveling with their owners or dogs that have been rehomed to other states. Um, in fact, Victoria has just made an announcement yesterday that they've picked up their first E. canis case. And so as it stands, ACT is now the only state or territory within Australia that has not recorded yet a case of E. canis in Australia. Um, but any of the Eastern states um, and, and the, southern, the southern areas like Perth, they're all at this stage uh, from dogs that are not from that region. So they're dogs that have been imported from endemic areas in the north. Um, another comment, I guess, on this map is that you might observe that there's a very straight line on the border of Northern Territory and Queensland uh, and a few question marks there in, in the northern areas of Queensland. This disease obviously being spread by ticks is not going to recognise state borders. Um, and so I would expect that the, this disease probably has already spread into some communities within Queensland. It's just that again, with that limited veterinary capacity, it's not yet been picked up. So will it spread? Uh, I think the answer is unfortunately yes. So the brown dog tick, uh, which is the vector of this disease, the carrier of this disease, is already present and widespread across Northern Australia. And we'll have a look at its distribution map in just a moment. But it's important to understand that this is a very adaptable tick. It, um, it really likes to, to thrive, in fact, in, in shelter and dwellings. And so in situations like pounds or kennels or even households, um, it really loves getting into cracks between bricks and, and, and reproducing very effectively. A single female tick can lay 3,000 eggs. So this, this tick is very good at adapting to um, the, right, the right conditions. And whilst it prefers those warmer tropical climates, if it's introduced into the southern areas and has sufficient shelter, it can still establish in those areas as well. Another important factor with the spread of this disease uh, is a realisation that so many of these remote Indigenous communities have really limited tick control options available to them. Um, and so that means that, you know, there's not control of this tick happening in many of these locations where the disease is endemic, which gives it the opportunity to continue to spread. As we've already touched on, those dog travel and relocations are already introducing these cases to the southern, southern regions of Australia and are likely to continue to do so, unfortunately. So this, uh, this map is, is an image from um, a, a paper by Chandra and colleagues um, that was looking at the brown dog tick distribution within Australia. Now, the, the red dotted line here that you can see on this image is the proposed distribution of the, the tick. So anywhere north of this red dotted line, uh, the authors of this paper are proposing that brown dog tick does occur. Um, AMRIC's been doing a bit of work with uh, some of our research colleagues of late, and we have actually, um, it's as yet unpublished, but we have actually detected this, this tick further south, even than this red distribution line even as far south as um, sort of the, the latitude around Sejuna in South Australia. 
So, uh, you know, as I've already said, this is a disease that can be transported inadvertently. It can establish quite well if it is given the right environmental conditions. So even though um, above this red line might be the preferred climate for this tick, um, it, it's likely that we'll continue to see cases further south. Um, so really, I think the potential Ecanis distribution, particularly for endemic regions, um, is, is likely to be all of the area covered in red here. Um, this is obviously a big part of Australia. There'll be many thousands, tens of thousands of dogs, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dogs within these regions um, that potentially could be exposed to this disease. But then we also need to consider that aspect of dog movement. And so even in these Southern areas where the, the tick itself may not be um, typically located, it is still possible that we'll continue to see cases further South as well. How did it get here uh, is a very good question. And I must thank uh, Professor Peter Irwin for many of the slides in this presentation, but this one in particular. Um, so it, there has been a surveillance undertaken in the past looking at tick-borne diseases, including Ehrlichia canis. Um, and basically that surveillance that's occurred over the last two decades has concluded that it was not present in Australia. Um, it, it seems like this disease has probably been recently introduced, although we do have a very large geographic spread. So it's probably been here at least, uh, well, certainly 12 months before the initial detections, perhaps longer. Um, and there has been some work to look at the actual strain of, of the bacteria that we have in Australia. Um, there are a few different lineages or strains of this bacteria that do occur globally. And that the work that's been done um, suggests that this is the Asian lineage here. So um, how it got here, still no one will be able to say. And, and in all likelihood, no one will be able to say that down the track at all. It's probably going to remain a mystery. Unfortunately, it's something that we are likely to have to live with now. So how serious is, is this disease? So we already know that um, you know, those chronic cases can suddenly be terminal, but at the acute phase, what we're seeing uh, and the, our veterinary partners in remote indigenous communities where there really is limited to access to treatments are seeing um, is that the mortalities are basically 10 to 30% of the dog populations. Um, and that, that's certainly consistent with the available data that we have on dog populations through the AMRIC app as well. Um, of course, just to touch on that, that cross around the treatments, you know, with the limited access to veterinary services, most vets are only in communities at most twice a year and, and usually for a few days or a week at a time. So it's, it's usually unlikely that that's going to line up with the acute uh, time of infection for most dogs and therefore access to treatment really is, is not an option for most community members. Um, so I, as I said, unfortunately, we're seeing 10 to 30% mortalities usually at that acute phase, but we have really grave concerns because um, we, for most communities, we don't quite think we're in the chronic phases yet. Some of them are probably just starting, um, but others haven't yet hit that, that peak. Um, it's really hard to get data on the proportion of dogs that will become a chronic, fate, a chronic and terminal case. Um, but I have heard it suggested from Professor Peter Owen that potentially 30 to 40% of dogs that survive the acute infection will potentially grow on, go on to become chronic cases. Um, so, you know, when you're looking at those two in combination, the, the mortality rates really are quite significant. Um, and this really is a serious disease event um, and certainly a, 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 an epidemic within Australia. Uh, so 12 months on from the initial detections, it's uh, a bit more than 12 months now, really. Um, it's clear that Ehrlichia canis is endemic in brown dog tick populations across the Northern Territory in Northern uh, and some of the, the Southeastern areas of Western Australia. Um, and in Northern SA as well. Of course, we had a particularly wet, wet season, the wet season just gone in the top end, and that has really helped to promote tick population reproduction, which unfortunately means that we've had a significant spread of this disease. Um, some of the veterinary partners that AMRIC works with are estimating dog prevalences of between 70 to 100% of dogs in some communities have now been infected with this disease. Um, and as we touched on mortality rates of between 10 and 30% of those dogs in the acute phase. 
As I said, treatment is a 28-day antibiotic course. Um, the limited access to veterinary services com combined with health literacy challenges means that for most community members, that is just not a feasible option. And so most dogs in remote communities are going untreated for this disease. Um, for those that do survive the acute infection, we are really concerned about what that chronic phase might look like. And particularly if those dog populations all hit that chronic phase around the same time. Now, what we're likely to see is large numbers of very sick, very skinny, um, really unhealthy dogs that really are, are, are going to be an animal welfare concern. And of course, uh, just as access to veterinary services is limited in so many remote communities, so too is access to, to animal welfare authorities. Um, and more importantly, I think it's, it's, it's really just a potential nightmare in terms of a PR issue for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities who already um, unjustifiably cop so much flack for the care of their animals, uh, when the reality is that this disease was not known to occur in Australia. Yes, it was preventable, but unfortunately, we didn't know that it was here at the time. Um, and so this, the, the condition of the, the, the chronic cases for these dogs is something that is not to blame uh, that the community members should not be blamed for. And that's something that I think is really important that everyone understands. Um, it's, it's, it's a really concerning um, prospect of these chronic cases and something that we're really working to try and raise awareness of so that everyone can best prepare themselves for this. Um, I wanted to just touch on a bit about AMRIC's advocacy in response to this, this disease. So when the disease was first detected in, in May, AMRIC, um, we, our response really revolved around advocacy and knowledge sharing. So we reached out to the chief veterinary officers or the CVOs uh, in each jurisdiction where brown dog ticks were known to occur, offering to, to share our knowledge of remote community veterinary service provision, offering sample collection capacity, offering to facilitate the supply of discounted tick preventatives uh, and leveraging relationships with, with Amrix pharmaceutical um, companies in, in order to do so. We also contacted our national network of stakeholders involved in the delivery of animal management programs from environmental health workers to local government staff, public health units, ranger groups, veterinary service providers, highlighting the detections and warning of the clinical signs, advising of the notifiable status of the disease and providing recommendations for community-wide tick treatments. Uh, we've also been providing regular briefings about ehrlichiosis and our advocacy to the Australian government, uh, both to the Department of Agriculture and the National Indigenous Australians Agency, who is AMRIC's major funder. Um, early on, as discussions uh, continued with these various stakeholders, it was clear that um, we needed to amplify the voices and the unique context of underserved remote Indigenous communities, challenging decision makers to think beyond the sampling and surveillance plans themselves, um, but to also consider, you know, what, what will happen if or when ehrlichiosis is detected within their jurisdictions. After sampling had occurred in, in, in each community, who would be responsible for communicating results to each animal's owner, especially considering that the vets who might have taken those samples are not likely to be in the communities by the time the results come back. Similarly, if positive cases were detected, um, you know, what happens around treatment? Uh, is, is treatment even feasible, um, given that you know, the vets aren't going to be in the community at that time when the results do come back? And of course, uh, one of the big questions was who, who then pays for treatment as well. Uh, more recently, our advocacy work has continued. So um, late last year, we commissioned P Professor Peter Owen to undertake a literature review looking at the zoonotic potential of Ehrlichia canis and also Anaplasma platus, which is another tick-borne disease that was already present in Australia. Uh, I'll touch on this, this literature review shortly. Um, we also hosted two stakeholder workshops in, in Darwin in December. Uh, one that was animal population focused and one that was focused on, on the human health implications of this disease. We've continued to advocate to and assist jurisdictional authorities in their respective response. Um, and we're now a member of the Northern Territory Government's Ehrlichiosis Management Working Group. Um, we've been looking at our own recommendations around tick prevention and, and in, in fact running a treatment trial to assess the feasibility of administering different types of preventatives. Um, that are appropriate at a community-wide scale and effective in preventing ehrlichiosis. Uh, we've been doing a whole lot of, of reaching out to our supporters to fundraise for the effective supply of tick control products. Um, and we've started distributing those. Uh, we've also been to Canberra and advocated the, the, the significance of this disease to both government ministers and departmental chiefs. 
Um, really, this disease highlights a need for a, a, a certainly more resourcing for animal management in remote areas, but also the need for a one health approach that acknowledges the links between animal, human and environmental health. And so that's been something that we've really been, been championing through all of these discussions. So those, those human impacts, um, you know, I think when we're talking about lichiosomes, we're talking about it at population level, it's really easy to just roll out some numbers, roll out some, some statistics, and it's easy to forget that these are people's pets. These are people's beloved companions. These are animals that people rely on for their mental health, for their well-being, sometimes even for their physical well-being. Um, so, you know, it's really, really important to recognise the, the mental and emotional impact that this disease is having in so many remote Indigenous communi communities across Australia. You know, we have some areas where families used to have five dogs and now they have one. Dogs that the veterinary service providers have seen grow up over the years or that have been dissected that have otherwise been very healthy animals that have succumbed to this disease and unfortunately died. When this disease is added to the already enormous burden of mental health and stresses in communities, it's just another thing that adds to the weight of, of, of emotional burden that people are having to deal with. And so I think recognising that is, is absolutely critical. From a physical health point of view, um, we, we really wanted to know more about the risks of E. canis to humans. And so that's why we commissioned Professor Peter Irwin to look uh, at the, the published literature around this disease um, and therefore the risk of, of both alichia and anaplasma, as I noted earlier. We do know that brown dog ticks do bite people, particularly um, when there's very high environmental tick burdens, as we often see in particularly the, the buildup and the top end, uh, the buildup and the wet season in the top end. Um, we also know that many remote Indigenous community members are already immunocompromised. They're already suffering from very high rates of chronic diseases. That mean their immune system isn't 100% um, and they may not be able to fight off infections that, are, that are, a healthy immunocompetent person would be able to do so. So what, the, what Professor Peter Irwin found when he looked through that literature review was that there's around a dozen cases reported internationally of Alichia canis being detected in people who've presented to hospitals with tick-borne disease type symptoms. Now, these cases are really all from Southern and Central America. And there's been a bit of work done looking at the Alichia canis strain or the type of Olichia canis that, that is present in that region. And it has been determined that it is slightly genetically distinct from the Olichia canis strains that are found in other locations around the globe. As I said earlier, uh, the testing that has been undertaken so far in Australia suggests that we have the Asian lineage of the Alicia canis bacteria. Um, so that potentially reduces the risk of this being a zoonotic concern. But at the same time, there's not really much screening happening for this disease at any sort of global level. In fact, all of the, the, the dozen or so reported human cases that are published in the literature have, have originated from only two research groups globally. So there's really not a lot of people looking for this disease. And of course, if you don't look for it, you're not going to find it. Um, and the other challenge, I think, with this disease in, in a human health perspective, too, is that the, the presentation in, in people is going to be similarly vague as it is in dogs. So they might be feverish, they might have aches and pains. Basically, it's going to present like flu-like symptoms, which of course can be attributed to a huge variety of different health conditions. And so people, uh, medical professionals, aren't necessarily going to be alert and on the lookout for this disease. Um, so definitely advocating around the, the potential zoonosis of this, this disease is something that we continue to do. We've got a proposal in under consideration with the Department of Health and Department of Agriculture at a federal level currently to do some screening around this disease. Um, but I guess what's important to recognise is that this disease really can be prevented from getting into humans if we really focus on preventing it in dogs. So uh, on that note, um, through our discussions with the, the, the various jurisdictions uh, early on in this disease, it was pretty clear that communications were going to need to take a very important role uh, in the response to the ehrlichiosis outbreak. And so we were really pleased to be able to assist, assist the different state and territory authorities, um, providing feedback on their communications and, of course, developing our own communications tailored to the audience of remote Indigenous communities as well. You know, many remote Indigenous community members speak English as a fourth or fifth language. Perhaps they have limited health literacy. 
And, and so it means that ensuring that we have communications messages that are developed that are culturally and contextually appropriate is really essential. Now, these resources that I'm going to showcase here, they're all available for free on our website. You're more than welcome to go and download them and use them in your own regions. Um, we developed a series of posters here um, that uh, were sent to our national network of animal management stakeholders and community-based media outlets. Um, as I said, they're also still available on the AMRIC website and there's, there'll be links in the presentation and we'll make sure those links are sent around as well. Um, the posters focus on tick prevention, which is really critical for ehrlichiosis awareness. Um, and they, the, they aim to really be visually engaging and use language and phrases that are familiar to many remote communities. Um, here we got sent this picture recently. So this is those posters up on display in the Pilbara. So it's really great to see them out and about. Um, important to recognize, I guess, that the tick recommendations within the posters, we can and certainly adapt them to what products are available locally uh, and the messages within them aim to tie into existing environmental health programs that are occurring within each region. Um, we saw before that this, this tick animation, um, I, I'm not going to play the whole thing here, but you know, we were really pleased to have the support of WA Health, Perth, New South Wales Health and New South Wales DPI uh, in developing the English version of this disease, of this animation rather. Um, we've also got work underway to get this animation translated. So we've already got a Creole version and an Andiliaquan version um, available, um, but we are also working currently on a Yolnu and a Pinjara as well to make sure that it really has as much reach as possible within remote regions. Um, as you can see, the animator that we worked with is absolutely fantastic. Um, and we've been able to get really great social media engagement with this disease, uh, sorry, with this animation. Um, in addition to the, the digital distribution, we've also been using this animation within our school and community education programs. And you can see our education officer, Michelle here, um, out and about sharing knowledge around this disease with kids in the McDonald Regional Council area. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how this disease is impacting animal health programs. And of course, it's really important to recognize that in remote communities, in general, resourcing for animal health programs is, is very limited and often very inconsistent. Um, historically, most remote community dog health programs or dog population programs have relied on antiparasitics, which um, are not effective, unfortunately, in the prevention of tick-borne diseases and, in, and particularly ehrlichiosis. Uh, Ehrlichia canis can be transmitted within three hours of attachment of a tick. Um, and so unfortunately that means that a lot of the antiparasitics available, um, both those that we've used historically like ivermectin and, and cydectin, um, and even some of the newer generation products that are available for purchase, they aren't 100% protective for this disease. Um, so we've been working really hard to try and develop some, some uh, effective community-wide treatment recommendations um, that also take into account the fact that dogs are free roaming, they're often not used to wearing collars, um, and the limited resourcing that's available to so many of these remote community health programs. You know, for individual dogs, we'll touch on the, 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 the specific preventatives in a second, but um, repellents products that, that repel the ticks from biting in the first place are certainly the gold standard recommendation. Um, but for community dogs, these repellents are products such as collars or spot-ons, and they can be really hard to administer. So we've been working with um, academics and, and experts who are, who are absolutely across these, these antiparasitics and also the parasites that we're trying to prevent um, to try and develop some feasible programs that remote communities can apply in their context. So um, in that regard, um, if you are a local government or an Aboriginal organisation that's wanting to improve your antiparasitic product programs, then please do get in touch. We can supply discounted antiparasitic products um, thanks to our support from pharmaceutical companies. So uh, we pass these discounts on to remote Indigenous community stakeholders, and that allows um, a number of organisations now to be able to move from um, products like ivermectin that you know, really don't have much tick efficacy to more effective products that are going to improve the health of the dogs, but also help in preventing this disease. If you're a stakeholder or a local government area that delivers dog health programs as part of your animal management program, really important to understand that micro, macrocyclic cyclic lactones, things like cydectin, ivermectin, moxidectin, dectamax, those sort of things, whilst they've been fantastic historically in improving dog health, there are much better products available now and these products do not effectively prevent ehrlichiosis. They have very limited efficacy for tick control and hence they will not protect dogs from developing this disease. 
For individual dog protection in high risk areas, the recommendation is that you use products that both repel and kill ticks. So Soresto collars or Advantix spot-ons are the recommendation. And that you use them in addition and in combination with an isoxazoline based product. So they're the things like Nexgard, Simparica, Cordelio or Brevecto Chews. Uh, Brevecto also comes in a spot on as well. Uh, for areas that don't yet have Ecanus cases in high numbers, the recommendation would be to uh, that a Soresto collar or Advantix spot on, something that repels and kills, tick, and kills ticks is probably sufficient. But for those high risk areas, having that backup with the isoxazoline, which will kill the ticks that, that might manage to get through the repellency of the collar or the, the spot on, um, that is the recommendation. Now for community wide dog tick control programs, it's a slightly different recommendation. Um, and that's because uh, the administration of collars or spot ons at a community wide scale can be problematic. Um, so what's recommended is that we use isoxazoline based products. So again, the next guard, Simpara for Cordelio, Brevecto Chews or the Brevecto Spot On. And they have a really high efficacy in killing ticks. So what that's gonna do is gonna lower the tick population overall and reduce the risk of ehrlichiosis. Of course, every community has its own specific needs. Every community has slightly different burdens and slightly different diseases that are that are presenting and, and potentially impacting on dog populations. The products that I'm mentioning here are only external parasiticides. So they don't cover intestinal worms. So it's really important to talk to your local veterinary service provider and make sure that you've got a, a, a broad uh, spectrum and comprehensive antiparasitic program that's tailored to the needs of your community. Um, now, if your local government area runs a pound, um, it's really important to ensure that you have really strict quarantine protocols in place. You should already have these. Um, but what I'd be recommending is that particularly in endemic areas, you have um, a protocol that you administer an isoxazoline based antiparasitic product on dog entry. Um, so it's something like Nexgard, Simparica, Cordelio, Brevecto, that's gonna kill any ticks that are currently on the dog and prevent them from spreading to other dogs that, that are already impounded. Uh, if you have a tick problem within your pound, you might also consider combining that isoxazoline with one of those repellent products. Of course, again, speak to your vets about uh, a broad scale program. These, these recommendations that I'm providing here are not specific to your own needs, um, but are broad recommendations. Another really important aspect of this disease is environmental tick control. So it's really important to keep your grass short. And if you do have a tick problem in your region to consider use, utilizing the services of, of a professional pest controller. Now, I've listed a whole lot of links to further information here, uh, including AMRIC's educational resources, advice on tick prevention, uh, our literature review that was, that was undertaken by Peter Irwin. Um, there's uh, the different jurisdictions websites and information on ehrlichiosis on each of those. Um, and we'll certainly sound, send around these slides. Um, so thank you very much. I feel like it's been a massive dump of information. I hope that it hasn't been too quick. Um, I, I'm really, as I said, really grateful for um, the support from the Australian government, for AMRIC, as well as our philanthropic donors, particularly grateful to Professor Peter Irwin for his assistance throughout this disease, um, and particularly for lending some slides that I've used in this presentation as well. If you do have any questions, um, I am happy to answer some now, but I've got my contact details there as well. Um, yeah, back to you now. Bonnie, that was incredible <laughs> a huge amount of information presented just so clearly uh, it was very easy I, I it filled a lot of gaps for me and I hope it has for other people as well so thank you so much there are some questions um, and I'm going to go to those now so Debbie asks what part of Victoria was it found in and did the dog survive uh, I believe it was detected in Horsham, that there's media about it today. I haven't read it in detail, but there's definitely, I've just seen some articles and headlines coming out. Um, the dog at this stage is still alive. I believe that it would be undergoing treatment currently. Um, uh, this, this dog was a dog that had been imported from the NT as part of a rehoming program. So um, it's not a locally acquired case in Victoria. But as I said, you know, with, with the spread of this disease, um, the geographic spread, but also regular dog movement with traveling people, it's, it's likely that everywhere we'll start to see more cases. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. Okay, and um, from Debbie again, for the dog that does recover from this, can it be a carrier for any future ticks to pick it up and spread it? Yes, unfortunately it can. So um, 
if if we think back to what was the, the process for um, dogs that were imported prior to the detections in Australia, um, they even if this dog wasn't currently suffering an acute infection, if this dog had any evidence, so serological evidence of having this disease in the past, it wasn't allowed to come to Australia. And that's because it can serve as a reservoir for this disease. It can be hiding in the bone marrow or, or the, um, the spleen, but still be picked up potentially by a tick at any point mm. in time. And so a dog that has suffered this disease, the recommendation is that it must be on very effective tick control. So an isoxazoline based tick control for the remainder of its life so that any ticks that do bite that dog are immediately killed and prevented from transmitting this disease to other dogs. Mm, okay. And from Ken in Alice Springs, how long will a dog live once infected and without treatment? We don't have the answer to that, unfortunately, Ken. Um, we, most of the cases where this disease has been studied in detail are cases that have presented to university hospitals or specialist clinics. And so these are dogs that are receiving gold standard care, really immense amounts of high, high, um, high quality medicine with huge amounts of equipment and medical support. There's very little published data on what happens to dogs that don't have access to good veterinary services. Um, and so we have reached out to our colleagues internationally who are running, um, you know, uh, street dog programs in, in, in Southeast Asia and, and um, similar programs throughout Europe and so forth. Um, but really, it, it, it's really difficult to say what we certainly what it seems like what we're experiencing in Australia is a lot more severe than in a lot of uh, countries where this disease has been well established. And that might be because uh, the, the strain that we have in Australia potentially is more pathogenic or more severe than strains that occur internationally. Or it could be because, um, and potentially it's a combination of the two, that our dog populations in Australia don't have any sort of innate immunity to this disease. They haven't experienced before. Their immune systems are not, they don't recognise it. And so um, they uh, suffer a much more severe form of the disease compared with dogs that are used to this disease and, and genetically have a bit of resistance to it. Um, so how long before it, you know, if a dog survives the acute infection, how long before it goes on to become a chronic case? We, we don't really know. Uh, we think that we're starting to see some chronic cases potentially in some of the top end communities where it had been diagnosed uh, and picked up early. So, you know, dogs that probably had this disease as early as May last year, if not prior. Um, but um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect a dog that survives the acute infection that does go on to the chronic stage to, to last more than a couple of years at most, I would think. Mm, okay. And so, Bonnie, if, for example, a tick travelled on a dog from Northern Territory to Victoria, how long would you anticipate that dog, that tick to naturally live in this very different environment? I'm based in Victoria and it's freezing here today. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if it's out in the cold, if it's out in the paddock and it's really exposed to the elements then those ticks aren't going to do very well. And of course, to reproduce, it does require either a pregnant female or a, a male and a female tick to, to then reproduce. So if it's a single tick and it's not pregnant, then that, that tick will probably die and, and it won't establish. Um, but as I said, ticks are very, these brown dog ticks in particular, are very good at reproducing. A single female can lay 3,000 eggs. If they're provided with shelter, so if they've got a kennel, um, if they've got somewhere where they can, you know, bed down in a crack and it's, it's not too cold, um, then potentially they could establish. Now, you know, they're not going to spread out over the landscape super quickly. That, you know, they've got a limited capacity to travel themselves. Um, but if it does establish locally and then, and then there's interactions with other dogs in that area, then potentially it could continue to spread. Mm, okay. And another question from Ken, does Amrik have any plans to work with Outback stores to supply effective products and an affordable price to residents? Yeah, absolutely, Ken. So we are already working with a number of Outback stores throughout the Territory and we've also just had Alpa sign up as, a, um, as, as Amrik being a supplier to them. So we're definitely growing that program. It's something that we, we don't have any specific funding to be able to, to focus on, but we're doing as best we can to really encourage stores to get on board with that or with our, with our current staffing capacity. 
Um, and by all means, if there are specific store contacts that you have, Kim, that, that um, you think might be interested in stocking effective products, then, then let us know um, and we can get in touch with them and encourage them to supply those products. We also have a whole range of educational materials that we provide to stores when we, we initiate that supply so that community members are aware of the products and familiar with it, what they, they, um, they cover and prevent. Um, rather than you know it just being this new product that no one knows about and it's sitting on the shelf in the stores, so it's a it's a comprehensive package and certainly we'd be happy to um, to speak to any any of the stores in your region. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, Ken's also asking where your virtual background is, and I think we'd all love to know. It's fantastic. <laughs> well, you you might recognise it, Ken. So this is uh, on the road to Kintore, actually. Um, so this this is an image taken a little while ago, but yes, it's um so it's nice. a pretty iconic road. Well, and Ken's also echoing my my thanks and my uh, appreciation for your presentation and lots of info that was easily understood. So there you go. Now we've got a, a question from um, someone in Aracoon asking if you can help us in Aracoon with discount products. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, I think we're already, if, if that's you, George, I think we're already in touch with you by phone and email, um, but we're more than happy to, to get um, some advice together for you on what products might suit your community and supply you with a quote uh, for those discounted products. And similarly for any other, any other communities that are out there interested as well. So um, I'll get our project officer to get in touch with you, George. But um, yeah, if anyone else is interested, please just give us an email. Either you can use my email there or shoot us an email at info at amrit.org. That's fantastic. And Fra's asking if this disease could be spread to foxes via the tick. Um, yeah, so there, there is a bit of work going into uh, what species are susceptible. Um, certainly, we expect that dingoes are going to be susceptible to this disease being um, closely related to domestic dogs. Um, foxes, I would have to look it up and get back to you. I suspect that Probably yes, um, but I yeah I'm not not a hundred percent sure on that one. But um, the perhaps not that you know the the scientific name Alicia canis usually is pretty host specific if they if they mention that um, Latin name of the host. So uh, it may only affect canine species, but potentially the fox is considered one of those. So yeah, I'd have to get back to you on that one. Mm, okay, that would open things up quite significantly again on top of everything else. Yeah. Um, Chris is asking, is the message to animal rescue groups for rehoming being recognised relating to this issue? Yeah, definitely. So um, amric has been in touch with a number of rescue groups. They've, they've both reached out to us proactively asking for advice and we've been um, including them in our mail outs as well. So. Um, it is, it is a concern that dogs will be inadvertently moved and transported as part of rehoming programs. Unfortunately, the reality is that many of the regions where these dogs come, are coming from, so the endemic regions where Ecanis is, is present, there's not local rehoming capacity within those regions. Um, so if those dogs are to be rehomed, really their only option is to go either to the Eastern States or to populous areas like Adelaide and Perth. Um, certainly um, what we're encouraging rescue groups to do is to work with their, their, the relevant state or territory government veterinary authorities to develop protocols so that they can make sure that they're applying appropriate um, preventatives, both to dogs that are going, but also looking at, you know, potentially implementing pre-travel testing and screening to make sure that the dogs that are traveling don't have any signs of this disease. Um, of course, that all adds extra cost to, to rescue groups and rehiving groups that often are run on a shoestring already. Um, it is a challenge and it's something that's going to continue to be a challenge, um, but there is, there's definitely work happening within this space. Um, and in fact, Nell um, has asked both myself and Professor Peter Irwin to present at the Getting to Zero conference, um, which is obviously an animal rescue rehiving focus. I, I think that's in August, Nell, um, mm. to, to provide some more advice around that specifically. So. Yeah, it, it's something that um, th there certainly needs to be a more coordinated approach there, I think, but it is a really, really hard one when um, the, the areas where these dogs are coming from just, you know, they're not going to be able to be rehomed endemically within those regions. 
And in, in addition to that, Bonnie and Amrick have helped the Australian Institute of Animal Management to put together a fairly simple uh, information sheet and advice uh, notification for local governments. So we'll have that up on our website very soon. You can access that as well as obviously all of the fantastic Amrick uh, resources that Bonnie's spoken to us about. Uh, so yes, George Meyer Aracoon. Thank you, Bonnie, if you could George, get we'll in, in contact touch. with him. That's great. And look, I think we can probably wrap it up. We could absolutely speak for hours on this. It's fascinating and terrifying all at the same time. Um, but we really appreciate you sharing all of that information with us, Bonnie, and no doubt you'll have lots more inquiries to keep you busy. Um, so thank you very much, Bonnie. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, stay tuned to our media pages, uh, social media and e-news for announcements about up and coming webinars. And if you ever would like to uh, suggest a presenter or some content, a topic that you'd like to cover, please contact us as well. So hopefully we'll see you next month. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Nell.